afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are we are going to start this event. Uh, uh, this online conference cycle on materials research in the scope of the RC's grants. And uh, today we have the privilege to be with Luis Pereira. And this is going to in his talking or is going to, to give us uh, communication about materializing the vision of nature inspired sustainable electronics. Uh, thank you all for coming to this uh, event organized by the Portuguese Society of Materials and uh, Luis Pereira and Jorge Coelho were enrolled in the organization of these ERC events during this year of 2021. Let me present you our speaker of today. Uh, Professor Luis Pereira was born in Lisbon, Portugal in 1977. He received the engineering degree in material science in 2001 and has finished the PhD in microelectronics and optoelectronics in 2008 at the University, Universidade Nova of Lisbon. His PhD work was focused on polycrystalline silicon and IK dielectrics for thin film transistors application. And this work contributed to the first fully transparent oxide semiconductor based transistor entirely produced at room temperature. Oxide TFTs are nowadays a standard technology in high technician active matrix, OLED, and LCDs. And the expertise gained on, on oxide materials for electronics allowed focusing the postdoc activities on the development of printed inorganic nanostructured materials for chromogenic, electronic, and electrochemical devices on paper and plastic substrates. He was involved in the team that demonstrated for the first time transistors made, made of oxides with paper as dielectric. In 2012, he got a merit position as assistant professor, then associate professor in 2015 at the Universidade Nova de Lisboa, settling his research team on printed and paper electronics. Since then, he has been exploring cellulose-based materials, both as substrate and constituent of electronic devices, including the use of printing techniques. In 2015, he got the ERC starting grant on the development of new cellulose oxide nanocomposites towards a new paradigm in printed electronics. The research activities in the last years were focused on the design and synthesis of 1D, 2D and 3D inorganic and hybrid nanostructures chiral cellulose nanocomposites, functional micro and, nano and nanofibers, and its integration on chromogenic, electronic, and electrochemical devices. He has authored and co-authored more than 200 publications in peer-reviewed journals and proceedings of the EZ with more than 8,000 citations and there's a H factor of 44 on Web of Science, more than 11,000 citations in and H factor of 50 in Google Scholar. In 2020, Luis has started a new challenge, assuming the position of scientific and technical director of Alma Science Collab nowadays he is also a member of the board of the Portuguese Professional Engineer Association, South Region, Vice President of the TCM Net Transparent Conductive Materials Network, and is, a, yeah. and is a member of the board of the Portuguese Materials Society, SPN. Luís, thank you very much for your enrollment in the organization of this cycle of conference and also for today's presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, George, thank you very much for the introduction. And I would like, first of all, to thank to all the participants in this uh, webinar. 
Uh, as George was saying, so this is kind of a series of webinars that has been organized by me and by my colleague George Coelho within the SPM. And today it took to me, let's say, the, it's my turn to talk because uh, fortunately I also got uh, ERC related with materials. And um, <clears throat> I will try to, to explain what, uh, what was the concept behind this, this, uh, this grant and also what were the, the main achievements that uh, me and my team uh, and all the, 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 the persons involved uh, achieved during this last, uh, I would say, five, five years. So um, I would like also, to, of course, to thank you to, to be here in July. So we used to organize this in the last week of July, all, all the months. But uh, of course, uh, we try to, to anticipate a little bit uh, this month in order to be one week earlier, in order to avoid the, the vacation period. And so we had this, this, this just small break of three, month, three weeks between the webinars. But uh, of course, thank you to all of you that are here today for the the resilience and uh, and I, I guess some of you are also uh, repeating the attendance so it's also great to, to see to see all of you today so i will share my screen so um <clears throat> share and uh, as uh, george uh, was saying so nowadays i have a new challenge so i, I i'm not anymore let's say a full-time professor uh, I'm a full-time uh, working now at, 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 at the Alma Science Collab, that is a collaborative lab that uh, deals with, uh, let's say, uh, transferring these uh, technologies that are being developed on paper, tech, paper and sustainable uh, systems, trying to, to take them to, to the market or some of them to the market. Um, but of course, this work was all done while I still was a professor and still today I'm invited, I have just a position as invited professor at Nova of University uh, in Lisbon. <clears throat> so, and, and the title for my talk today, it's indeed, um, uh, I'll try to, to show that uh, using materials that are provided by nature or structures that are mimic what happens in nature, we can make devices, electronics and photonic devices. Uh, and so trying to materializing, so that, that's why I put this title. So to, to make real and to turn real all the, the, the concepts of uh, sustainable electronics. And so uh, let me just give you a point. So uh, the talk today will be basically about um, uh, printable inks, uh, what we can do with printable inks that contain uh, uh, cellulose uh, as one of the constituents of these inks. Uh, how we can make electrolyte, uh, solid cellulose-based electrolytes and uh, where we can use them on electronic devices, um, how we can use paper and tune paper, or I would say more, not, not exactly paper, but cellulose fibers to make dielectrics for transistors, and how we can, at the end, also uh, functionalize fibers to create uh, um, energy harvester uh, devices that can also be made on paper. So this is basically the motivation for today. So uh, I would start by saying, okay, sustainability and how we can target sustainability more, more specifically in terms of electronic devices. Um, of course, we can use these three vectors like using advanced functional biomaterials. Uh, uh, so using materials that are more uh, eco-friendly or could be extracted from nature or could be easily recyclable or reusable. Um, and also you can work on the manufacturing process, so to use low energy demanding process, or of course you can also think on the eco design of the system, so thinking on, uh, okay, how we can recycle or dispose or recover the materials or the, or the electronic devices uh, after, the, uh, after being used. So these are three vectors that I will talk about today, okay? And just for a brief introduction, so just to say that uh, why e-trash e and what we call it electronic trash, uh, it's, it's, it's a big issue. So we know that nowadays uh, we are always demanding for new electronic devices. We know that thinking on these buzzwords like Internet of Things where we want everything connected, more and more electronic devices will be, will be fabricated. We all know that recently we had a shortage in the, in the supply of electronic components because the demand is increasing. Um, and, 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 and if the continuous demand uh, that is increasing like uh, 
very, I think, exponentially, it, it continues for sure. Uh, we need, we have two problems. One that is um, the supply of raw materials and the second will be to deal with the end of life of all these systems. Okay, and so just, just to contextualize a little bit. So in 2016, if you consider all what we, can, what we can tell or classify as electronic trash, you see that uh, the, the total wave of this electronic trash is something like 40, around 45 million tons, okay? So it generates, if you consider the herd population, uh, uh, something like every year we were generating something like six kilos of uh, electronic waste per annum. Okay? okay, and uh, the, the estimations is that they will increase and they are increasing about 50 nowadays, okay? about 15 million tons. Okay, maybe this way it doesn't mean much, but like 45 million tons is something like uh, 4,500 Eiffel Towers. So in terms of weight, that is being wasted uh, every year. Of course, this distribution is not uh, even all over the world. In the developing regions, you have more waste being generated. Of course, in other developing regions, the, the waste is less. But not only the waste is, as, as I said, so what about the materials and the potential value of the materials that were wasted in uh, 2016 in electronic uh, goods are is around 55 billion euros. So we are not only generating waste, we are losing value because we are not recovering the materials that are, are there. So these are two problems that indeed exists with electronic waste and that tend to increase as the use of electronic devices also tend to increase. And so of course we don't want this, this electronic waste is being handled by, by, by not so skilled persons and not in the best conditions. And of course the dream, and that's why I said materializing the vision. So it would be that recycle, recycling electronics would be like recycling paper, okay? And uh, just an example of paper, because I will talk about cellulose of course, but also because recyclability of paper is a very well established uh, process nowadays. So it would be a very, very inspiring uh, way to, to do the, the recovery and recycling of electronics. And of course, having in mind also the sustainable development goals of uh, United Nations, and contribute to some of them, uh, like sustainable communities, a responsible consumption, climate action, uh, and life, life of land, for instance. So why paper electronics? Okay, so paper is not, at the first sight, the, the first selection that we do for do electronics, okay? Because we know we have already well-established um, electronic devices that we use uh, every day. And uh, these new technologies that, uh, could, could, could arise from what I'm talking today. Of course, do not aim to replace what is nowadays the conventional electronics. As I mentioned before, so there will be a demand for new electronic devices as all objects tend to be connected. And we can think in new concepts to create electronics uh, for these new demands, okay? Going a little bit away from what is the conventional electronics. But of course, conventional electronics will be here uh, for the future. And we need that, uh, this type of electronics because it's been the ground also for our, our evolution. Uh, and we don't want to replace this, 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 this type of electronics. But just by curiosity, if you put all the silicon wafers that were used to produce electronic devices in 2020, these will sum up an area of around 8 million square, uh, square meters. Okay? Uh, just by, by curiosity, one simple paper machine like a navigator has in, 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 in Setubal, for instance, could produce the same amount of area, let's say the same area of paper in just seven hours. Okay, so if you multiply these by all the paper mills that exist in the world, so you can, of course, understand that there is a lot of raw material, material available, at least as a substrate that we could use, cheap, is recyclable, that we could use to build some, some electronic devices. Of course, then we merge to the column that is in the middle, that is to do this type of electronics, we don't. We we must also uh, avoid the use of conventional uh, electronic uh, industry processing. So, like clean rooms, like uh, subtractive uh, methods, like uh, vacuum processing, and it makes sense to use paper only if you use also, uh, let's say, simpler process like those similar to printing. Okay, I will call it printed because it's very similar to, to graphic printing, but of course 
inks and some of the process are modified in order to allow to print, for instance, in, in conductive layers, semiconductor layers, or dielectric layers that what typically we need to, to make electronics. And of course, then you need to develop the systems and find the right applications for the systems that you are making. This is an example of a fully printed uh, gas tag with a display, with a sensor, with transistors. But uh, of course, you need to, to, to have in mind the right application, depending also on the performance of these systems that, as I said, they do not perform the same as the conventional electronics. Also, the level of integration, so the size of the things that you can produce by printing is not the same as the size of the things you produce by conventional electronics. So we, we always have to have in mind this compromise. Okay, But having this in mind, of course, we can think on some applications for for or new applications uh, for this type of electronic devices on paper or in flexible substrates. Um, every time I, I talk about this, I used to say, of course, the holy grail will be the smart packaging because it's where we have the volume. Okay, so you imagine all the packages that are deployed every day. Uh, and you know, nowadays with the increase of e commerce, that of course, if you want to have tracking on your packaging, to know if what is going on inside the products that go in the packaging, if the fish or the food, it's, it's spoiled. So if you can consume it or not, not do not rely only on the, on the validation date, that is a kind of statistical uh, determination. So this could also contribute to the reduction of, uh, of food spoilage. So this is where you have really a good, a good market, but typically where you don't have much margin to increase the cost of the packaging. Uh, on the other hand, you have also a market of biomedical devices where, uh, of course, you have a little bit more margin to, to introduce the extra value for these smart, smart sensors or, or, <clears throat> or smart techs for applications in, uh, in biomedics. And we know from this pandemic that, for instance, fast uh, screening tests for virus, for antibodies, for uh, a many, many other applications uh, are, are really a demand. And they're disposable, and you know the COVID tests that you do with the plastic casing. So uh, these are waste that is being generated. So nevertheless, of course, you can do if you can do this with a more sustainable approach. Of course, it would be it would be great. Okay, and so in the past work that has been developed also in the group in, in Senimat uh, at Nova University, uh, there was already many work done on. Um, on different devices made on paper, and we could consider memories, batteries, displays, sensors, solar cells, even some circuits. And of course, when you think on paper electronics, you may think on using systems where some of these devices go together, uh, can have more or less, depending on the complexity of the system. You can have also some uh, communication, uh, like an antenna. So, and this is basically having a kind of uh, puzzle pieces, okay? And you can join those that in a kind of what we call it heterogeneous integration, you can join some of them in order to build the system that you want. <clears throat> okay, so now focusing on the work that uh, was done in the frame of the, of the RC grant. And as I said, so one of the, the objectives was using paper as a substrate, but not only that. So to use also cellulose-based materials and cellulose derivatives to make the functional materials that we need to create the system. So basically cellulose will not be only the substrate, but would be also an active material for, for, for these type of things. And so I'll start by talking about carbon, ba carbon fiber based electroconductive inks to, to make printed sensors. And so the strategy was to mix a cellulose derivative that is carboxymethyl cellulose that is soluble in water. So cellulose is not soluble in water. It's very difficult to dissolve. So either you need uh, nasty solvents, or you can use ionic liquids, um, or you can use another strategy that I will talk later. But uh, if you modify chemically the cellulose and you get what we call cellulose derivatives, this one, carboxymethyl cellulose, is soluble in water. So it makes very attractive to make inks because are water based inks. And so, of course, then you need some other material that gives a specific function like conductivity, and you have your carbon fibers. You make a ink with the proper rheological. Uh, let's say, uh, characteristics, because then you need to adjust the rheology uh, or properties of, of the ink to the, to, the, to the printing technology that you are about to use. And you can print sensitive layers made of this ink. Uh, we studied, of course, this is an example, we studied the amount of uh, ink that we need to have a kind of 
conductive percolation path for current to, to flow in these layers. So, and then you, you can look for the amount of ink, of course, that you need in order to have a stable uh, resistance or resistivity on these layers, sorry. Um, so this is, was one of the studies. The second study is how the change in resistivity uh, would depend also on the drying conditions. And we have an example on, of if a sample is dry at 120, it has a high resistivity. If it is dry at room temperature, it has a low resistivity, even with the same amount of ink, let's say. And it has to do basically with the final structure of the ink, because if you force the drying, you get the less dense layer. If you let the, the, the ink or the layer dry by itself, you get the more dense layer. And so this affects the resistivity. So it can see, it seems that could be a bad thing. But indeed, if you want to use as a sensor, it is a good thing to have a kind of less dense structure because it will respond, for instance, better to humidity variations. Okay? So, and we tested this as humidity sensors and why it works nicely as humidity sensors. So we have in the, in the ink or in the layer uh, carbon that gives the conductivity, but remember we have also the CMC that is a cellulose derivative that is water soluble. So it's also hygroscopic. So it will, uh, let's say, absorb partially the, the, the moisture and humidity in the environment. And so this will affect the, the, the percolation path between the, the carbon fibers that exist in the printed layers. And so you have a variation on the resistivity of the, of the, of the layers with the, the humidity. And that less dense, let's say, structure uh, responds better to, to humidity than the, the dry, the, the room temperature dry uh, structures. Uh, they are also sensitive to temperature because you have carbon. The carbon are be is behaving like a semiconductor, okay, the carbon fibers. And so its temperature is the resistance will decrease with temperature. And since the, re the response of with temperature is different than the response with humidity, you can decouple uh, both responses and basically use this type of calibration curves to, to know uh, the temperature and the humidity levels that you want to determine. The same strategy to use the cellulose derivatives was uh, implemented uh, for creating semiconductor layers. So the carbon fibers are highly conductive and we, the idea were to make conductive layers. Here we are aiming to make semiconductor layers. So some layers where we can modulate somehow the conductivity by uh, ourselves. So with, uh, with a very controlled uh, manner. And uh, these were used to make printed zinc oxide based device. So the, the, the strategy here was instead of using carbon fibers to use zinc oxide nanoparticles, okay? But again, so you have derivative. Uh, we started with the til cellulose instead of carboxyl til cellulose. In this case, this cellulose derivative is soluble in uh, not so friendly solvent system like toluene ethanol or acetone uh, toluene, but but uh, after some, some time, we also changed this, this approach of using uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles to be used as a, with CMC, with carboxyl to solids, that is water soluble. Okay? So there are lots of works that where these inks were explored, but I will explain basically two types of devices that we made with these inks. So one is the UV sensors. And for UV sensors, you just need to print the electrodes that were based in carbon and the sensitive layer made of carboxyl to cellulose and zinc nanoparticle. If you proceed with the, with the, the placement of electrolytes that will behave as a dielectrical, I'll explain later why, and put a silver electrode on top, so you could uh, move on for transistors. Okay? And so for UV sensors, we have here an example of some UV sensors made not on paper, but on, a, on top of another natural substrate that is cork. Cork is a very challenging substrate as well due to the roughness of the surface and the, this uh, honeycomb uh, microstructure that it, it, it has. So we also had to optimize the, the amount of ink that we could put on top of the cork and then the, 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 the carbon electrodes. Uh, but, and then of course, compare the response, uh, the UV response of these sensors. With more conventional substrates like glass, of course, we can get better printer quality on glass than on cork. This is due to the, to the rough surface. But what is important is that these sensors without any specific encapsulation had similar response even after one month, okay? So after being produced. And also under, under bending, after some bending cycles, it was losing, they were losing basically 
uh, I would say less than 10% of the maximum current that they could achieve under UV radiation. So um, this was demonstrating that uh, these inks were quite stable um, and the response that we get to UV work was quite stable uh, with time. Okay, so I said that then if you put the electrolyte and then uh, a gate electrode, so if, uh, another electrode, we can make a transistor. Okay, do you have here an image of, of a transistor? Uh, so in this case, we have this, what we call a three, two, three terminal devices. So it's what we call the source, the drain, and the gate. And basically you control the current that flows between the source and drain electrodes by putting a voltage in the gate. So by field effect. And what we do is basically control the conductivity of the zinc oxide layer that, sorry, the zinc oxide layer that is between the source and the drain electrode. And we do it by applying a voltage at the gate and using the electrolyte that behaves as a dielectric to control the conductivity of the zinc oxide uh, layer. Okay. So is, is the, this is the paper without the zinc oxide printed on top. And this is the, the, the paper with the zinc oxide printed on top. Okay. Again, having in mind the real properties of the ink to make it possible to, to print. And you have here the transistors already printed on paper. So uh, just a brief note why we can use uh, electrolytes to, to behave as a, as a dielectric. So in a conventional dielectric, we, we know that the capacitors of a capacitor with a normal dielectric will depend on the thickness of the, of the insulator. Okay, and it's inversional, inversionally proportional to the thickness. So if you have a thicker dielectric, uh, lower the capacitors. But in electrolytes, if you use electrolytes to behave like a dielectric, uh, this dependence disappears, what is very good, because uh, typically we make uh, electrolytic membranes that have some microns in thickness. This is good that we don't have this dependence. And why we don't have this dependence? Because in electrolytes, you have kind of mobile ions. Okay, They are mobile. And if you put the voltage in one electrode, so this is the gate electrode, you have like a kind of shift of the ions to the opposite plate of the capacitor that is the semiconductor that is here represented in blue. But ions, if they do not enter in the semiconductor, so if the semiconductor is not permeable to, to, the, to the ions, they will accumulate at the interface. And of course, you build up a, a charge net, that opposite charge, charge layer of opposite charge next to the interface. These are electrons that you accumulate near the interface in the semiconductor. So you are creating kind of conductive layer for electrons uh, in the semiconductor by pushing these ions to the interface, the ions that exist in the electrolyte. And so you are creating a conductive channel where the current can flow from the source to the drain electrode, as I said. There is another method I will not explain in detail because it's not the case for our materials, but you have uh, semiconductors that are where the ions can enter into. And in this case, you have what we call electrochemical doping. So we have a change in conductivity by electrochemical reactions. But this is not the case for our, 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 our zinc oxide nanoparticles. So this is more for uh, organic semiconductors. OK, <laughs> we'll be back to the transistors later. I will just try to show that, of course, we can print uh, layers, like conductive layers. We can print semiconductor layers, as I explained before. Uh, but why, why, if you try even a simple approach that is instead of printing, you can write. So to print, you need kind of complex machine. Nevertheless, you need a printer. Uh, if, you, if you go for writing, this could be much easier. So and there were already some concepts and some commercial products where you could use silver uh, pens. So where you can write basically uh, silver inks and create conductive pads. This was already presented in the past by other groups and is commercial product, as I said. But the difficult thing was to, and uh, the difficulty is to write, for instance, semiconductor layers. Okay, uh, and we also develop a strategy to write inks with zinc oxide nanoparticles. You see here the student. Uh, this is a calligraphic pen, the normal ink that is used in calligraphic pen, and now calligraphic pen with the zinc oxide nanoparticles ink that becomes yellowish. You see here the, the, the lines that are being printed. And you see here the, the top view of these written layers. And you see here the cross section of these written, uh, we call it now written layers of zinc oxide nanoparticles. Okay. So the strategy here was not to use uh, carboxyl to cellulose as a, a binder in this ink. 
uh, we had to change a little bit the, the strategy and we were using a kind of zinc oxide nanoparticles again, but in the ink we have a zinc nitrate and HMT, um, that is a compound that forces the composition of zinc nitrate at low temperatures into zinc oxide. Okay, So why we want this? Basically, if you use just zinc oxide nanoparticles, you get a printed layer or a written layer that is something like this. So uh, particles lying on the surface and the percolation for current goes where you have contact between particles. Okay, But without a binder to fix this to a surface, if you blow on the surface, the particles will flew away and so you lose your film. So the strategy of having this dual phase layer was to have the zinc nanoparticles and then the decomposition of the zinc nitrate into zinc oxide will create a filling, let's say, between the particles that is also a zinc oxide layer. And with that, you could improve the percolation and also improve the adhesion and also the stability of the ink on top of the paper, okay? So we have here the impedance measurements confirming that the, 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 the impedance was reduced. So we improved the, the, the percolation and we use this to create transistors. Okay, and the transistors here use paper as a dielectric. So paper behaves like a bad electrolyte here, and I will explain also later other concepts that we developed to improve, uh, let's say, how paper can be used as a dielectric. But in this first approach was used normal paper. You have the zinc oxide layer written here, you have the source and drain contact, and you have the gate contact on the opposite side of the paper. And remember, paper works as a dielectric, it's a solid state electrolyte with a very bad ionic conductivity, um, but works like electrolyte in, work, working as a dielectric. So it's what we call electrolyte gated transistors. And uh, as I said, so the capacitance is independent of the thickness of the paper because we are just counting on the charge separation between ions and electrons on the semiconductor that occurs at the interface with the semiconductor. So basically, what happens is that, I'll just go back to slides, sorry. What happens is that what really is your capacitor is this separation that we have here with a very narrow distance. It means that with a very small voltage that you put at the gate electrode, you, have, you reach a very high capacitance because you can consider here your capacitance as a positive and a negative charge separated by a very small distance in the nanometer range. Okay? So this brings up to very high capacitance values. Okay, so as I said, the paper itself is not the best dielectric if you, if you don't, let's say, modify it. And this means that uh, you need high voltage. So the conductivity, the ionic conductivity is very bad. So you reach very low capacitance when you try to drive the ions through the, through the paper to the interface. And uh, it means that you need high voltage to operate such devices. Okay, and besides, if you, then you have some hysteresis because when you remove the gate voltage, the, the ions need to relax to the original position and also take time. So in, in principle, you could have also memories. This was explored also in the past to make memories with this effect. But if you want, let's say, transistors operating is a normal switch, you need to have, uh, let's say, transistors that relax or, re, re, or return to, 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 the, to the original uh, uh, state. Uh, uh, very fast. So if you put the positive voltage, you open the transistor. If you take the voltage and you go back to zero, it should close. So it should not stay open if you want a, a fast responding transistor. Okay, so <clears throat> those electrolytes that I told you about that uh, were being developed uh, are also based on the cellulose. Okay, so we are using microcrystalline cellulose and this is not chemically modified. Okay, it needs, it's basically cellulose. It needs to be dissolved. And as I said, so either use nasty solvents or you can use, for instance, this type of approach that we use that is uh, using alkali uh, salts and urea and water, okay? Uh, and we can dissolve cellulose, okay? Of course, uh, we started with lithium hydroxide and then we were moving to sodium hydroxide. You see here that sodium hydroxide, pure sodium hydroxide is not the best to dissolve, uh, to fully dissolve the, the microcrystalline cellulose, but uh, with a mixture of 5% of lithium hydroxide and 95% of sodium hydroxide, we can get a good dissolution of those solubles. Why we try to push for sodium hydroxide? Of course, it's more abundant sodium and uh, I would say more friendly than, than lithium. Uh, 
we are also using carboxy methyl cellulose as a, an additive to control then the, the mechanical properties of the, of the membranes. Before being used, we need to uh, neutralize it because you are using uh, uh, alkaline uh, conditions. So we need to neutralize, otherwise you could destroy the, the semiconductor layers. And then you can produce by shear casting some membranes like these ones I'm showing here. And this is just uh, to show the effect of the addition of carboxy methyl cellulose. So to control the, the properties of the membranes to get it slightly more flexible, not so brittle, uh, not so wrinkled, so more uh, flat uh, and smooth, uh, <clears throat> smooth membranes. And so you can get something like this. And one good thing about these membranes is they are, let's say, sticky, okay? And you can cut them uh, and place them on the on your devices, like stamps, okay, in a in an easy way. And the best thing about this, I will show you later, is that you can reuse them, and also at the end you can remove it and recover the materials and make new membranes again from the material that you recover. Okay, there are also there's also self healing properties. Okay, because um, if you have an example, you can cut and they can be repaired under the, under the moisture conditions. Okay, you have CMC in the constitution, so this will promote a kind of uh, uh, healing under uh, moisture conditions for, for these membranes. This is just to show um, okay, that we played with the ratio of uh, sodium hydroxide and so uh, that the ionic conductivity was still in the millisiemens uh, per centimeter range. Um, of course, ionic conductivity was higher when we have lithium hydroxide. Uh, it was reduced with sodium hydroxide. It has to do with two things. So the presence of the lithium ions and also then the capability of these membranes to retain water inside because water will also determine the ionic conductivity or, or will facilitate, of course, the mobility of ions in these membranes. And also for cutting the healing cycles, uh, you see that, um, Okay, uh, this will affect slightly the, the ionic conductivity, uh, but you see that uh, as well, depending on the composition, of course, we are starting already for a lower, uh, a lower, uh, a lower value for the ionic uh, mobility, but uh, ionic conductivity, sorry, but nevertheless, we could stay again, as I said, in the millisiemen range, millisiemen per centimeter range, even after four yielding cycles. Okay. Okay, uh, okay, I, I forgot to mention uh, one negative point of this approach of using electrolytes as dielectric transistors, because that formation of those layers next to the interface that we call it electrical double layers depend a lot on the frequency of the excitation voltage that you put um, on the gate. And you see that the capacitance behavior uh, of these membranes, so if you measure some impedance spectroscopy, you see that you, it's the phase angle goes below minus 45, you enter in the, in the capacitive regime. So you see that the capacitance that you get is high in these membranes, up or down, uh, sorry, up to one kilohertz, okay? Above that, you, st you start to see a, a great decrease, okay? And it means that effectively these transistors will not respond very well uh, above these uh, above these frequencies, and will respond very bad at a very high frequency. So this brings a limitation on the operation uh, frequency of these um, of these devices. Not everything is good when using this strategy. But okay, going back to the good things <coughs> about this, you can print, as I said, the, the, <coughs> the source and drain and gate electrode. You can put the semiconductor ink. You can cut the electrolyte membranes that will behave as a dielectric and put it in the device. And at the end, you can write, use writing uh, tools to complete your circuits. And here is an example of logic gates that were fully printed and written. Okay, so this is an example of a NAND uh, logic gate. And you see this behaves like an inverter. Basically, if you put the voltage in a <coughs> in, the in uh, transistor, you get that output uh, that is um, reversed from the from the in, in input voltage. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. Okay, so uh, I I mentioned that also paper uh, it can be used as a dielectric or electrolyte in these these electrolyte gated transistors. But I pointed out that one of the, one disadvantage is that it has very um, 
you need high voltage to operate such devices because the paper itself is not that good in terms of ionic conductivity. It has a very open structure as well. So it's not good, not perfect for this application. And of course, you can play with the fibers uh, that we use to make these membranes or paper-like membranes. So you can use microfibers, you can use nanofibers. Uh, so you can play with the dimension of the fibers depending on the treatment and also on the source of cellulose that we use. Uh, you can even go, and I will explain later, to crystalline, so crystalline cellulose, that is nanocrystals of cellulose, because each fiber, so if you grab a big fiber, a big cellulose fiber, you, you start to continue to try to mechanical or chemically separate um, this big fiber, it will separate in small fibrils at the, until you reach nanofibers um, in diameter, and even these nanofibers you have inside places where the cellulose chains are very well arranged and other regions where they are randomly arranged. So kind of crystalline regions and the morphous regions. And you can selectively get rid of the morphous regions and retain only the crystalline regions. And you, you end up with nanocrystals, cellulose nanocrystals, basically nano rods of cellulose that are crystalline or almost pure, 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 pure crystals, sorry. This is a top-down approach. You can also use what we call the bottom-up approach. So using uh, cellulose, uh, bacterial cellulose, okay? So the cellulose fibers produced by bacteria. Uh, there is also the, you can also produce uh, cellulose fibers by lateral spinning, of course, but uh, these produced by bacteria are also very interesting. There are nano, nano fibrils, so the, the, the diameter is in the range of some nanometers, okay? And they are very interesting as well because they are very pure in terms of, uh, of uh, composition, okay? And uh, the advantage of using nanofibrillated cellulose or the cellulose coming from bacteria is that you get much more dense structure due to the nature of the fibers, small, small diameter. And uh, we have explored this to make this type of transistors where, okay, the dielectric is the cellulose uh, paper-like membrane is the same function as the electrolytes that I presented before. In this case, we have a vertical structure. As I said, so you have the semiconductor here. Uh, sorry, you have the source and drain contacts in one side and the gate electrode that basically controls the conductivity of the channel layer here of the semiconductor is on the other side. Okay, so one of the things we did is what we call it uh, ionic doping of these membranes. So you produce the membranes, okay? Due to the, to the chemical treatment that you do, okay, even the pristine membranes are already very good to be used in transistors because these ones, uh, I guess, were, were produced, uh, were oxidized already. So you have some carboxyl groups on the, on the surface of the fibers. And um, okay, so this was already good to, to, to have some protonic uh, conduction on, on these membranes. And you see that we are talking now about voltage much, much smaller than the voltage I presented before. So just by playing with the chemistry of the fibers and the dimension of the fibers, you can produce membranes that in transistors, they work very, very small voltage, okay? Much, much less voltage than the ones I presented before. But you see that for pristine, uh, that are the black, uh, the, the dark, the blue, dark blue here, you still have some hysteresis. And if you get, you want to get rid of this hysteresis, so, uh, in the response of these resistors, you can go and tune the, the ionic properties or the ionic conductivity properties of these membranes by making addition of lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, and potassium hydroxide. Okay, and basically what you are doing is trapping some of these ions inside the membranes, and of course, depending on the treatment, I said that you have some carboxyl groups here on the pristine membranes. The affinity of the ions will depend also on the on the on the fiber finishing that you have. Okay. And so you see that the response is not only having uh, hydroxide that will improve, okay? The improvement will also depend on the type of hydroxide that will also depend on the type of treatment or pretreatment that you have in your surface of the fibers because these will have a preferential, uh, let's say, um, preferential uh, link to one specific type of ions, okay? So carboxyl groups have Preference, uh, have preference for one type of ions. I will talk about sulfate groups that have a preference for other type of ions. And you see that this will affect the response. Okay, so here the best response that we got was not for lithium, for instance, when we're having lithium hydroxide, was we're having for sodium uh, in this case here. Okay, so you see no hysteresis and 
uh, very low operation voltage from uh, minus two to two volts, you can completely go for off state to completely on state in this transistor. So you see the current, when you say off state and on state, so it's how the current changes from, uh, for instance, a very resistive uh, state where the current flowing between the two electrodes is in the nano, nano amps range to the where you can reach almost milliamps range uh, <clears throat> by playing with the gate voltage. Okay, as I said, so you can go deeper uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the separation of the, of the fibers and you get rid of the amorphous domains and retain only the, the crystalline domains. You end up with nanorods, that's what we call it, cellulose nanocrystals. They have here a very interesting property, okay? That in a, let's say, uh, aqueous suspension, depending on the concentration of nanocrystals, uh, they can be suspended in water and depending on the concentration, they can self-assemble in a uh, pneumatic liquid crystal okay, uh, way. So uh, you have the pneumatic liquid crystal behavior. And so you, if you reach the perfect concentration, you can get what we call the cure pneumatic phase. And if you let it dry, this concentration and you let it dry in, in control conditions, you have this arrangement of the cellulose nanocrystals. Okay? And so you see that in one plane, you separate in different planes, you have all the crystals aligned in one direction. In another plane, let's say the director will change and it will change until it rotates. And let's say the wavelengths that it takes to, have, uh, to, to, to rotate will, will basically determine what we call the pitch of this rotation. And this will behave, this is interesting, like a photonic crystal, okay? Uh, a photonic crystal that has the preference reflection to left circular polarized light. That is, let's say the direction where the, these crystals uh, rotate and we'll let the right circular polarized light to pass through. So if you use filters, you can see structural colors uh, coming from these, uh, these, uh, these cellulose membranes. Um, and you see here the cross section and you see how the crystals are arranged and forming these, uh, these twisted structures. Uh, of course, they do not form perfect structures. Okay, As I said, playing with the drying conditions, you can form more or less perfect uh, structures. But they do not form perfect structures, and you have some defects. That's why you have different colors. Also, depending on the drying, you have here what we call coffee ring effects. That is to the drying not being uniform in the center and in the in the edge of uh, of these uh, droplets. And uh, all this contributes to non color non uniform colors. But nowadays we can control it very well, and you can get very uniform colors even with different shapes than just these droplet like uh, membranes or films. Okay, but going back, how we can use these in devices? Again, so you have here not a paper, but the glass substrates. You have a, a, a conductor, basically, that is ITO. You put this material on top of the ITO. You form these membrane crystals. You can play also with the chemical doping of these membranes. And remember that now we have sulfate groups, and then the affinity of the sulfate is different for the different ions again. Okay, and. Um, you make then the, uh, the semiconductor the position and the source and drain electrons position. And you can make, uh, again, devices working at very low voltage with very reduced, uh, um, very reduced uh, um, hysteresis on this. And basically, the affinity of these groups that exist in the surface of the cellulose means that you will trap some of these ions, either potassium or sodium. and these ions will form also a hydration shell within, within these, uh, these membranes. So we will retain some water inside that is good for ionic conductivity. So uh, we can improve the ionic conductivity by this chemical doping, but what you are doing indeed is also to improve the water retention inside contributes to the mobility then, ionic mobility within the films. But more interesting now, it's how we can take profit of this uh, structure, internal structure of, the, of these membranes. And, and as I said, so the, the, it is selective to different states of polarization. So it lets the right circular polarized light to pass through and it reflects the left CPL. And so doing so, we can control the pitch of these membranes to be in the same wavelength of the absorption of the semiconductor. So, and you can make a device that is controlled either by electrical signal or by optical signal because you can putting light in the device 
the semiconductor will absorb, we will change the conductivity. So you have a kind of what you call the dual response device. It's sensitive to uh, electrical signals, but also to optical signals. Okay, in this case, we are using uh, polarized light, circular polarized light. And so it's sensitive and can distinguish between right CPL and left CPL, just because these membranes act like a filter for uh, this type of polarization and controls the, the, the wavelength that reaches the, the, the semiconductor layer. Finally, a work that was uh, done in collaboration with another researcher here in, uh, in Senimat. Uh, <clears throat> it's now the functionalization of fibers to create energy harvesters. Okay. And um, you see here, I will put here a, a video. So you see here, the um, how does it work? So it's a kind of triboelectric, but it's not exactly triboelectric effect. Uh, it's, it's a, I will explain uh, in Italy a little more detail how does it work, but basically it transforms mechanical energy into electrical uh, energy. So you can get pulses of, uh, of energy uh, by punching uh, or eating these, uh, these structures. And these are made of uh, what we call it an active layer that is cellulose fibers functionalized with a conductive polymer. Then you have a metallic layer that we call it the charge collector layer. And then you have the encapsulation uh, that can be also made of paper. So you can make this kind of paper, paper cards. This, the way this, this, this it works, so the mechanism that was proposed to, to, for, for this to work is like you have the network of the polymer uh, functionalized fibers. Uh, by eating, OK, uh, you have the kind of uh, charge delocalization or sort of car charge uh, uh, accumulation uh, uh, by eating. So basically, you are changing the Fermi level of, of the semiconductor. And then if you facilitate, if, we, if you create a kind of localized uh, uh, charge carry uh, increase, you can move the Fermi level closer to the, to the, to the conduction band, in this case, to the uh, LUMO and uh, of the polymer and choosing the right electrodes, uh, you can, by increasing or pushing a little bit the Fermi level, you can, you can facilitate the charge transfer from the, the polymer to the electrode and collect this, this charge and have a current flowing basically in the system. So um, when you restore this condition, you get, of course, to the kind of self-compensation. That's why you get the kind of negative pulse if you look in the oscilloscope. You get a kind of positive and a negative pulse uh, appearing in these uh, in these systems, where the positive pulse is bigger than the negative pulse. But you can see there in the oscilloscope that this this is occurring. So this is the part of the realization of the of the system. Of course, you can play with the number of cells that you use and the way you connect them. Uh, we also studied the influence of the pressure. Uh, and of course, you have a limit on the pressure because uh, at a certain point, the system does not respond to, to, to let's say, to increasing pressure, what is more or less expected based on the mechanism that uh, I explained before. And also uh, in the frequency, depending on the frequency, you may have different, uh, different, different response to this uh, on the system, but not the, the difference as we get for, for pressure. And you see some videos here, <clears throat> just we can power up to 90, 29, uh, sorry, 29 LEDs with just one system like this, an optimized system. And you can make these nice, I would say, videos, at least nice videos. Of course, the power, the power, I would say, efficiency is still low because if you calculate the energy that you need <laughs> or the power that you put in the punch and the power that you extract is still low, but it depends a lot uh, also on the electronics that you could use for, 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 for controlling these systems. Uh, and of course, lots of things are still under, under optimization for, for, for optimizing these power efficiency. So as a summary, I will put here just two videos to show one that is what you call it uh, heterogeneous integration. That is basically uh, combining uh, transistors, sensors, even electrochromic display. We don't have here a battery, but there is also a possibility to put here a battery. We are using external power source, but the sensor detects the temperature. It controls uh, the resistivity of this element. This will allow the transistor to open. The current will flow provided by the external source to the electrochromic display that will show up a message. Indeed, the message was dangerous gas because this system was designed for a gas sensor, but to test in the lab is much easier to, to replace the gas sensor by a temperature sensor. And 
just to show uh, the 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 effect that uh, you can combine different types of devices together. And and finally, also having in mind the the question of the recyclability and recovery of materials. So this is the process to make these written circuits that I showed before. Okay, so printing the the, the, the semiconductor, the electrodes, then the electrolyte that is placed. Okay, in the transistors, then making the, the resistors and the logic gates and the connections. Uh, but the most important point is that at the end, you can recover, of course, uh, uh, the materials part of it. You can, for instance, recover the electrolyte, the electrolyte membranes. Okay, uh, the rest, <clears throat> you can disperse again this or dissolve again this and use, sorry, you can dissolve again this and use to, to make a, to make the new membranes, okay. You see here, you drop casts, and the, you can disperse. Now it's correct. You can disperse now the fibers that make it paper. So like cutting and make a kind of paper uh, pulp again from the used materials. That to, remember that here you have the paper, the carbon ink, and the zinc oxide nanoparticles ink, okay. But that can be included in the in the recycled paper because, for instance, for inorganic uh, fillers, you have already in paper normal paper inorganic fillers, so they will be retained in the paper and fibers. And, and uh, before drying, you have these materials, and after drying, you have the because let's say paper is very simple, but just to show recycled paper. And at the end, you can also recycle the electrolytes that you made and cut again to make new membranes that you can reuse it in new devices. So that's all. Of course, this was possible only because of the team of very dedicated students, PhD students and postdocs, and also to the work uh, of the rest of the team that exists at Senimat that provided support for this work, and also the funding agencies. Uh, and of course, we are here talking today about the, the RC and so the support given by the new fund grant that was the, 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 the RC starting grant that, uh, that uh, I received uh, and that started in 2015 and that ended in 2021 because I asked for extension to the COVID so it ended in last May so I'm now preparing the final report for it so it's a good time to talk about it because it's really a wrapping up the wrapping up of all the work that uh, was done so uh, that's all so thank you very much to, to all of you. And now I'm free, of course, to, to listen to, to some questions that you might have. Thank you, thank you Luis, for, for this fascinating and innovative uh, world of materials for electronic applications. Um, I open now the, the session for, for questions, for doubts that you have, or even some comments. That, that you can can do uh, in this in this final part of this uh, event, uh, and we have uh, Mahmoud uh, raised his hand. So please go ahead and ask your question. Um, good afternoon. So thank you very much for the very nice talk that you had. Um, do you hear me well? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so uh, my question is, is uh, coming back to the to the issue of recycling. Basically, um, uh, we have we can see the electronics uh, more complex electronics where they have already the microchips integrated and, and have more complexity. Whereas uh, the, the the electronics that you show are like more simple. They they can be implemented on the paper. It's like a perfect match for the, for the packaging, as as you told uh, in the beginning with all the sensors. Um, when we want to move to a bit of more complex electronics, um, is there the possibility of integration of um, more complex microchips into paper electronics? And if so, um, can they be as well recycled or um, what are the challenges to, to, to address? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I would separate in two questions. So the first is the type of complexity that you can get on this uh, on this type of, uh, of systems. 
As I said, so this is not intended to replace conventional electronics. What we can do now is, uh, and what we have to do is use printed methods. And uh, you have different limitations from the quality of the layers that you use, the resolution, the, so the, the minimum dimension of, of the things that you print. So this is really intended for low complexity electronics at the moment. So um, if you want more complex functions, that's why I say it, 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 it's correct what you mentioned. So you need sometimes to combine this with some more in complex electronics that comes from normal microchips. And in that case, well, it's uh, complicated to say if you can recycle or not these, uh, these microchips. So because you can imagine like a tag and you have nowadays these RFID tags that most of them have an antenna and then a printed antenna and then have a microchip. So you don't recover these microchips typically. If you throw away this, this tag, it goes and you cannot, you cannot recover. Um, I would say that in our work, we didn't tackle this. What I can say is that for sure, and I believe this is something that should be implemented in the future or will be implemented in the future, are what we call it eco-design strategies. So you need really to think even in these silicon microchips that now are nowadays very thin and you almost cannot notice that, um, you can you, you need really to think if, for instance, for packaging, if it works to use this type of devices, because remember that packaging will last for, depending on the product, for two hours, one day, two days, five days, or years. So which type of package will require this type of text? And then linking to Echo Design is to say, okay, if you really need to develop chips for this, makes sense to make it easy to recover at the end before throwing away and kind of finding a way to, to, to reuse, reuse it or to return it. Uh, I'm not sure which will be the best, the best option indeed. What I can tell is nowadays they are not recovered and uh, we cannot continue. If you, if you imagine that all package will have a, a tag with the silicon chip, this will be impossible because after three, five years with the conventional silicon chips, you would be throwing away, uh, let's say, silicon chips as, as in, in, a, in a huge number. So it, it will be impossible to, to sustain. So the idea is, of course, to try to evolve on the complexity of these printed systems. But uh, I would say that in the short, medium term, you, you need, still need to live with sometimes with integration of conventional electronics. And that is indeed a challenge for the recycling, of course. And I would say that. Uh, Okay, I will repeat, but I would say that um, the solution for this is just to find a good way for uh, allowing to recover it or to find a second, that is also a trend, to find a second life for this type of products where we have this type, this type of, uh, of electronics. Because just an example, so if you design a package that will last for two days, but it's very important to have electronics, okay, think that okay, in the strategy that you, maybe you can reuse this package, okay? Or you can, this should be a reusable package and not a package that will go to the, to the trash after, after two hours or five hours. So I, I would say that at the moment, this would be the best solution to tackle this problem. Uh, and and uh, yeah, thank you very much. So, and, and in, in, in terms of this kind of simple chips that you mentioned, such as RFID, how far away we are to actually print these chips? Well, on the, I must on say, the paper, for instance. Yeah, yeah. I must say that um, you can find already some uh, works, uh, maybe not on paper, uh, but in other substrates where you start to see some printed RFID text. Okay, because as I said, paper is not the best uh, surface to do this. Uh, then, in some cases, also these RFID texts that are produced, I, I, maybe at at least one or two steps, they need to go through a kind of etching process where they go deep in, in, in let's say, in the solvent tank to, to etch something. And this is not really compatible with paper. So, but there are already some demonstrations of printed RFID texts, but uh, there is a lot of room for, I would say, uh, chipless things, uh, passive elements only may, may make uh, kind of uh, tags that are used just ratifiers. Uh, to make uh, printed uh, kind, kind of circuits that uh, could uh, harvest energy, printed circuits that could respond at specific frequencies just by using resonance uh, circuits. So there are a lot of things that can be done with simple electronics, uh, not, uh, let's say, away from pure NFC. But for NFC, and also replying to directly to your question, there are already some concepts on flexible substrates, 
made by vacuum technologies, making partially by printed technologies, but uh, using other type of substrates other than, than paper. So the challenge is always to try to, 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 to bring this to, to, the, to a paper surface. You can do it by different ways, either for instance, direct printing, or you can transfer these like a stamping, producing a foreign substrate and then stamping these on, on paper. It could also be due, like in a tattoo uh, strategy. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Luis. Uh, we have another question, Jose Capitão, go ahead. Hello, Professor Luis. Thank you for your presentation. I liked you. I liked it very much. Uh, I'd like to place a question on the uh, energy harvesting part. Mm -hmm. You used the Fermi level to explain that uh, occurrence on the oscilloscope. However, I'd like to ask if it could not be some type of piezoelectric phenomenon. Yeah. yeah, this was been a great discussion around the, the referee for, for the paper. Uh, because we are proposing this method <laughs> for for explaining the, explaining the charge the the charge uh, transfer um, and uh, they were claiming that could be triboelectric assisted by piezoelectric effect. Um, okay, so we discard we, we didn't discard this because the phenomena is still open. Uh, I'd say we are still trying still to 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 to. to to discuss internally, which is really the, the phenomenon. But uh, making the, the, the tests with different frequencies, with different uh, pressures. Um, so this type of saturation that you saw, um, this type of dependency of, on the frequency, also on the temperature. So we make this type of measurements and we discard that this could be purely piezoelectric, even because you don't have a kind of, or we don't see how we can have a kind of perfectly aligned domains within the structure of the of the of the of the polymer it's a kind of agglomerates that are formed on the surface of the fibers uh, would be very we didn't make any pooling uh, process so it would be very very strange if this would be a only by chance it would be a kind of god god luck to have any kind of domains of aligned dipoles inside the the, the structure so this was a discussion, but we, we put this apart to be a pure piezoelectric effect. So we, we tended more for a charge transfer uh, process than the piezoelectric. Okay, thank you very much. No problem, Jay. Luis, uh, when, when you start your presentation, you, you talk about uh, the drying uh, system at room temperature or yeah. 120 degrees. Uh, uh, why 120? So you studied the best temperature range for this drying and you arrived to the, this temperature to be the best one. Uh, my second question is about the, the nature inspired sustainable electronics. So this, this is related with the cellulose materials, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the third one is about the recycling. And you, you shown us uh, some videos, but uh, I'm wondering when you use like a lithium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide or potassium, uh, is this going to affect the, the recycling process or not? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take the second one. Uh, uh, sorry, this, the first one that was about the temperature. Uh, indeed, it was a kind of process to study, but uh, uh, this is, was a water-based ink, and so we are basically studying okay, uh, the best way to, to dry it. Okay, uh, and we basically at 120 you force immediately drying. So if you put this at 120, almost immediately dries. Of course, it depends on the amount of the, of the of the ink that you have. But yes, this is a kind of process that we we optimized for for drying for drying these um, these these inks. Uh, the second question was about, sorry, George. The, the, the nature inspired. Uh, nature inspired, yeah. It has to do with, with the use of cellulose of natural, uh, of natural materials. And also uh, the last part of this, uh, I didn't mention because, uh, okay, the time is also short to explain everything, but uh, uh, these chiral pneumatic structures uh, that gives origin to what we call structural colors. This also exists in nature in some uh, some uh, some nat natural occurring structures. So, uh, for instance, these uh, photonic crystals or structural colors uh, 
are, for instance, uh, type of structures that you see in the uh, butterfly wings that uh, gives the color to the butterfly wings, or some okay. bugs also have in their bodies these type of structures that give them some color. Uh, the last one about recycling. Uh, the last one about recycling is a good point, and that's why we try to recover the membranes without mixing them with the paper pool, because we know that uh, we have hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide. I would say that the amount of membranes that you see also in relation to the amount of fibers that come from the paper substrate is in principle would not impose big issues on, uh, on recycling. But we also, as I demonstrated in the video, we are aware that whether to recover it and just send it to, to recycle. But nevertheless, again, the base of the letter of the membrane is so low. So, uh, could be, I would say, not a big issue to, to go with the, with the paper. But we prefer to demonstrate that it can also be recovered and regenerated and uh, be give rise to, let's say, to new membranes. So it can be reusable, not disposable. OK. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, some, some other question. Diogo, Diogo Garcia has also raised his hand. Diogo, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. What I wanted to ask is concerning the sulfonated cellulose, um, because it could be proton conductive, right? So have you did some kind of test with uh, fuel cells or electrolyzer cells? Yeah, uh, the sulfonated cellulose crystals came from the process. So it's acid, uh, acid hydrolysis and phosphoric acid, and uh, you get these uh, uh, sulfonated on the surface. Uh, in terms of ionic conductivity, it is ionic conductive, and that's why we can use it for for, for, for desification as a electrolyte uh, dielectric behavior. Uh, we can play a little bit with ionic conductivity, as I said, by doping it with other ions and increasing the water the water retention that contributes to the ionic mobility within these, uh, these membranes, but we never test this for other applications. So we only tested this for, for these uh, type of applications in transistors. We never test these membranes, for instance, in the other devices that could be, be using the electrolytes. So at the moment, I cannot answer this because we never tried this. Okay, okay, thank you. But I'll one just... thing that uh, uh, we tried in the beginning, <laughs> I must tell you, so I can tell you because there is not, it's not a secret, even if it is not published. We tried to see if the vertical conduction could be somehow affected by the helical structure. Mm -hmm. And we tried to make structure membranes and compare the vertical conduction with membranes where the crystals are randomly oriented. The problem is that we, it's very difficult to make the random oriented structure because you need to go out of the concentration uh, regime in a different concentration regime and you are already starting from different starting points so at the end you cannot compare things where you have a solution or a dispersion sorry of fibers or of, of crystals with different concentrations so it's not comparable and it's very difficult out inside the, the, the this tropic phase it's very difficult to to make films that are not ordered and we try many things uh, at the end i guess we managed kind of disordered film but we never proved that the conductivity was affected by, by this uh, helical structure. This is something that we tried to, to prove, but was not, we, we didn't succeed on this. Okay, okay, thank you. I was questioning because um, usually sulfonated membranes are used for fuel cell application mm -hmm. and they are usually quite expensive. So if we have uh, cellulose based membranes, it could be quite interesting and quite a revolution. Okay, so if you work on this, you, we, we can send me an email and can, we can try to, to, to look and uh, if this could be could be an option. Yeah? Okay. Indeed, tomorrow we have here, this is Paul Gray, I see he is still here. He will defend his thesis and it, it was his PhD work. So uh, then we, you can talk with him and see if this could be a, a good application or not for these membranes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Diogo. Uh, we still have an, uh, another question, Paul Gray. No, 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 he's making, a uh, oh, okay. just making a okay. Okay, <laughs> okay. so, <laughs> sorry. So uh, are there any... No.
no uh, if are not any other questions so let let me thank you again Luis Pereira for for this uh, presentation and uh, you all for the participation in, in this event and uh, we will have uh, another 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 talk so in September we'll come back again with our with our uh, events online about this topic of uh, uh, this this grants uh, and uh, I wish you good vacations if you didn't have it yet uh, and uh, we'll see you